Hey guys, how you doing? Let's try that one more time. How you doing? Yeah, y'all got to be a little more excited than that. The sun finally came out. So I'm telling you. Um, listen, I do want to encourage you to pick up tickets if you haven't already, this 411 event. We, God is just opening up so many doors. It is an amazing thing to watch what God is doing right now. There's so much. I, I just, you know, I got, I, I'm just excited about it. So pick up tickets. But listen, listen, everybody do me a favor. If you get tickets, show up because I will have bought you dinner. And if I buy you dinner and you don't show up to eat it, that's just rude. All right, so, so for real, if you got, if you got tickets, show up. Um, now, I want to start something. I want to do something for a few weeks here. I want to talk about what we are doing and why we are doing it as a church and what that means in your life. Because listen, sometimes we get all caught up in the church has a purpose and the church has a direction. And the church's purpose and direction is like separate from my life. It has no application in my life. I want to show you to it today in the next few weeks, I want to show you how your life directly impacts what we are trying to do inside and through the church that Jesus has given us the privilege of being a part of. So I got to start right here. The purpose of New Life Church. I, I, I need you to get this. I want you to hear me. Everybody listen. You ready? You ready? We are not building a church. We are building a movement. You need to know that. Look at your neighbor, say, we are not building a church. Oh, no, 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 no. A little better than that. We are not building a church. We are building a movement. Now, some of you are offended by that. Some of you are offended by that right now. You think I'm dissing the church because I say we're not building the church. But I'm not. I want you to hear me out. Think about something. If, if that offends you, I want you to answer a question. Answer one question. You ready? How many churches did Jesus build? The answer's none. He established the church. But folks, listen to me. The church did not meet in one place, in one location, under one roof with one group of people. And when we say we're building a church, we get lost in the fact that we're building one building in one place to put one group of people under one roof. And that's not what Christianity is about. In fact, I got to tell you, I think Christianity is struggling in the West anyway because of the fact we're so focused on building the one building to put folks under that we've called that the church and decided that's what it is. The church was never meant to be that. Buildings constrain movements. You say, then we got to quit building buildings. No, you got to have somewhere to put folks once they find Christ. But the goal is not the building, is not the location, is not the one group of people. The goal is the movement of the blood of Jesus washing clean the hearts and the minds and the souls of men, women, and children, and the Holy Spirit filling them to the point that their lives are actually changed. You say, how are we going to do that? We're going to do that by having a significant impact on our culture for Christ. Now, now look, I'm holding a book here. Significant Impact is the name of it. Now this, everybody, everybody listen, you know, you know I put out books once in a while, right? But, but this is not a new one. It's not. I want all of you to know that. I ordered a limited number of these uh, for this event. This is not a new one. But if you don't have this, I want you to pick it up. Because what this is going to talk to you about in much greater depth than I can in these sermons is how your life can have a significant impact on the world around you. So if you don't have this, I want you to pick it up. Same, y'all know the drill, right? 10 bucks for the book, but if you don't got 10 bucks, you get the book. Because I want you to have the book, and I need you to have the book a whole lot more than I need you to drop a $10 bill. Everybody's got that? So if you don't got $10, look at your neighbor and say, get a book. Look at your neighbor and say, if you ain't got $10, get a book. Look at your neighbor and say, if you got $20, drop $20. You see what I'm saying? Spot somebody else if you can. But I, no matter what, if you don't have this, if you haven't been through this, I want you to pick this one up because it'll help us all speak the same language, all right? Now, how do we change the world? How do we impact the world? How do we start a movement? The, 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 the truth is, the truth is, there are a lot of answers to those questions. But, but let, me, let me explain something. We're not starting a political movement. Therefore, we're not using the tools and the, and, and, and the direction and the ideas of political movements. You know why we're not starting a political movement? Everybody hear me. Because politics are not the answer. 
And politicians are definitely, never mind. Um, I mean, there's some good politicians, don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong. But, 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 but that's not the answer. We are not starting a financial movement. Because let me tell you something. If we start a political movement, there's, there's a pattern for that. There are, there, are, there are advisors for that. There are people that can make that happen. If we're starting a financial movement, there are patterns for that. There are advisors for that. There are people that can make that. We're talking about a spiritual movement. That impacts the entire world. And see, some of you, your eyes glaze over when I start talking about impacting the entire world because you're like, oh, that's too big. We can't do that from La Plata. <laughs> no, we can't. I'm going to be honest with you. We can't. You say, well, then why are you preaching a sermon? Because watch, no, watch, watch. I want to show you something. I want to show you something. Global impact occurs after community impact has occurred. Right. If enough communities get changed, then the global impact takes place. You say, well, okay, but that's still no better. That's still bigger than I can do from here. Oh, 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 okay, well, watch, watch, watch. The world is changed when communities are changed. And communities are changed when individuals are changed. Because when individuals find that the blood of Jesus washes away their guilt and the Holy Spirit helps them live a new way, then other individuals around them in that community are changed by what they see in that life. And then before long, that whole community's changed. Then another community sees what's happening in that community and they get changed. And even, y'all see what I'm talking about? See, sometimes I use these big phrases and your eyes glaze over and you get lost in them when really in the end, what I'm saying is Jesus needs to change us. God's going to change the world, but he's got to start by changing me. See what I'm saying? So how does that work? Look, 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 that means you got to tell people about Jesus. Oh, no preacher. I could never do that. Well, why? Why? Well, preacher, you know, you're like all spiritual and all. And I'm glad you are. But, 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 but preacher, 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 preacher. I don't mean to be transparent, but I'm just messed up. I'm too messed up to share my faith. Whoa, 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 whoa. Can I tell you something? This is part of why the movement is not happening in our culture. Because let me be honest with you. And I, a preacher loves you. It's going to be all right. Everybody's got that? All right, so watch, watch, watch. Many of you in this room, won't share your faith because you believe you're too messed up to talk about Jesus. Okay? Now, I need, I need to tell you something. I, I, got, I, I got it. Okay, spoiler alert. You ready? Everybody's messed up. Okay, look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor. Tell your neighbor with authority. Tell your neighbor, you're messed up. You see? You know what proves you're messed up? How much you enjoyed that proves how messed up you are. (laughs) You see, we're all messed up. You say, well, we need some more biblical characters. They were messed up. (laughs) Abraham was not. Are you kidding me? Abraham lied about his wife to the point that he almost gave her to another man. So uh, King David wasn't messed up. You ain't read the story yet. (laughs) Look, the disciples, all of them are messed up. You said, no, 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 no. The apostles, they were, well, at least Paul had it all together. Right. (laughs) Paul was just a good rule follower. That's all he was. He was a good Pharisee until Jesus got hold of him. And then he realized he was messed up. In fact, let me prove my point. Let me take you to a point in the life of Paul, a statement from Paul that I think everybody in this room is going to relate with. Every single one of us is going to relate with this statement from Paul. It's in the book of Romans. It's in chapter 7. I want you to go to, if you got your Bibles, let's go to Romans chapter 7, all right? Now, Paul in Romans is writing a letter to the church, the the, the church, which is largely Jewish, but they are in, they live in the city of Rome. So he's writing to these people. And here's what he says in chapter seven. Every one of you are suddenly going to realize you've got a lot in common with the apostle Paul. You ready? Watch this. Chapter chapter seven, Romans chapter seven, verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. Can I get a witness? You see what I'm saying? Let me say this a different way. I know that the Bible is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. All of us understand that. All of us have felt that way. I know that the Bible is right and that the Bible is spiritual and that the Bible is godly, but I'm not any of that. 
Okay, watch. He, he, he keeps going. But I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. Watch what he says. I do not understand what I do. I bet I could get another witness right there. <laughs> I do not understand. How many of you? I mean, come on. Don't, 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 don't confess anything like with your wife and kids around. But <laughs> I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. That is exactly the way we live our lives. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. Why? Because the law provides boundaries. And if I'm going to spend a lot of my time messing up and doing what I don't want to do, I need some boundaries to keep me from going completely off the road. So the law is good because it gives me boundaries because I have a tendency to do what I shouldn't do, what I don't want to do. And I have a tendency not to do what I want to do because what I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, I do. And I don't know why I do it. Keep going. As it is, verse 17, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. Some of y'all going, oh, there it is. I'm just a victim of my own. Sorry. Stop. <laughs> the devil made me do it. Stop. That is not what he's saying. You know what he's saying? He's saying you struggle to do good and to do right because there's sin inside of you. You were born with it. It's been there the whole time. It's haunted you from the first day. It's there and it's constantly trying to push you to the wrong ideas, the wrong choices, and the wrong places. It's not saying sin made you do it. It's saying sin is in there. That's why you keep falling into it. Okay? Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Okay? Verse 18, oh, y'all, I'm about to mess up your Disneyology. I have to apologize ahead of time. Verse 18, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me. So your Disneyology is screaming at me right now. <gasps> You see, here's what happens. You're, 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 the world has been telling you that when something's wrong, what you got to do is dig down deep inside of who you are and come and find the goodness that is inside of you and draw it out and let it go. The little mermaid said so. Stop it. Nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. There, you know, you know, here's, no, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let's keep going. I'm going to get there. For nothing, I, I know that good does not dwell in me that is in myself. I'm not sure. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Keep going. Verse 21. So I find this law at work. Watch. Watch. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. For in my heart, I want to be a good Christian and follow the Bible. That's what he's saying, okay? For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is at work within me. Watch. Remember what did we just talked about the last few weeks. We talked about spiritual warfare, right? And I told you, remember I told you, it's not the ooga booga. All right. Spiritual warfare is not about all the ooga booga that Hollywood shows you. Spiritual warfare is about God trying to guard the hearts and the minds of men and women all around the world. In other words, it starts with truth. It ends with truth and it guards your head with the helmet of salvation and it guards your heart with the breastplate of righteousness. Watch Paul saying the exact same thing here. He's saying that there is another law. It is at war with my mind. He will say in just a few chapters. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is a battle for your mind. This is a battle for your heart. And if you're not careful, you're going to let Satan win it. I want to show you this. Let me, let, let me keep going. Verse 24. What a wretched man I am. Have you ever prayed that prayer? Amen. What a wretched, I can't tell you, you know, in all transparency. I can't even tell you how many times I've gone to the Lord and I've said, Lord, I have no idea why you still put up with me. 
I'd have thrown me off this planet a long time ago. And I, I'm not being funny with you. I'm not, I'm not playing games. I'd have thrown me off this planet a long time ago. But you see, God chose not to throw me off this planet. He chose to work with me and through me, even though I'm messed up. And I've decided I like his plan better than my plan. So I'm going to let him work in me. And as long as he's willing to, I'm going to do my best. You say, oh, you're the preacher. You got to get it all right. How many times I got to tell you, I'm just slogging through this thing with you. We're just doing our best. You say, whoa, I know I'm messed up and I know he's messed up, but I know you were messed up. I'm messed up. (laughs) Everybody's got it? Because we're human. It's where we are. All right. Now watch, 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 watch. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Listen, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Say amen, amen, because you ought to. <laughs> I want to show you something. I want to show you, I want to show you a couple cycles. The next few weeks, I want to show you some cycles in your life that are going to either tear you apart or are going to make you better. So we're going to start with the first one this week. Watch. There are two cycles I'm going to show you. Most, okay, look, 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 look. Look at your neighbor. Remind your neighbor. Preacher loves you. It's going to be all right. Now, because cause I'm, I'm going to spend the rest of this sermon all up in your stuff, all right? It's just the way it's going to work, okay? So, so, so most of, everybody listen to me, almost everybody in this room is living at least one portion of their life in the cycle I'm about to draw, okay? Because the first cycle is the cycle of failure. Most of us all... <laughs> See, I'm trying to be too nice. We're all living at some point of our lives in this cycle. And let me show you how this cycle works. It's exactly what the apostle just said to us. Watch. I desire, I desire good. See, let me tell you something I believe about every human in this room. In fact, let me tell you something I believe about almost every human that lives. Almost every human that lives desires to be a good person and desires to do good things. We all desire to be good people. The problem is we all fail at it from time to time. So it's not like anybody's out there desiring to be evil. I mean, maybe there's a couple, but you know, for the most part, human beings desire to do good. And that's where you start. I desire to do good. But here's the problem. It leads to I do bad. I desire to do good, but I do bad. Well, well, how does that work? Well, that's what the Apostle Paul just said. He said, the good I want to do, that I don't do. But the evil I hate, this I keep on doing. That, that, That is true. Everybody listen to me. That is true. It's some place in your life that you're struggling with. You're trying to do good, you want to do good, but you keep doing bad. And here's what happens. You desire to do good, but you do bad, and that, me- that makes you feel guilty. So what happens? Because I feel guilty, I even deeper desire to do good. I'm trying to do good, I want to do good, but I keep doing bad. And when I do bad, it makes me feel guilty, so that makes me want to do good, desire good even more, but then I desire good even more and I fall down. Now, let's try to illustrate this. Let's start with your diet. Let's start there. That'll be easy, all right? It's it's not offensive, all right? But you got to understand, I'm going to talk about your diet, but you're going to be thinking about something else because the Holy Spirit's going to tell you something else. Well, I'm, mm. <laughs> Here's the way this works. I desire to do good. So we wake up in the morning and say, I desire broccoli. <laughs> Why? Because broccoli's good for me. Broccoli will make me skinny and pretty. You know, <laughs> broccoli is what I need. I need to be healthy. I desire broccoli. And you decide in the morning you desire broccoli. But by the time you get to the end of your work day and you are stressed and you are out of control and you have eaten nothing but broccoli all day long and you are now grumpy, what happens on your way home? What happens? You drive past the Krispy Kreme. (laughs) And that hot now light is on and it is singing to you like an angel. (laughs) You go, I got it. 
And then what happens in about 20 minutes, you're talking to somebody and you are crying. I don't know what happened. I was trying to eat broccoli. I didn't pick it on a broccoli. And all of a sudden, my car just turned in. And I don't remember. And now there's two empty boxes and I have a stomachache. <laughs> and now you feel guilty. So what do you do? About time, about time you go to bed, you say, well, I'm, that is not happening tomorrow. So you get up tomorrow and say, I desire broccoli. <laughs> and when you come home, that same hot now light's on. And then you're in the same crying fit at the end of the day because you still got two boxes of empty donuts. You see what I'm saying? Two empty boxes of donuts. But look, look, look. This happens. And we go through and we fail and we go through and we fail and we go through and we fail and we go through and we fail. And this becomes a downward spiral that slowly digs us into a hole, a pit of despair that we can't get out of. In fact, let me tell you something. The world has decided that the way to fix this, since they're tired of living in despair and they can't make it out, they've decided the way to fix it is just get rid of this. Just get rid, just decide there's no good and no bad, and then you don't have to feel guilty about anything. Amen. But that's not the answer. That's killing us. Settling for the least common denominator is killing us. It's killing us individually and it's destroying us as a society. We've got to understand that. You know what this is? This is all about self help. It's all about self-help. This is a cycle of self-help. This is the cycle. This is the only cycle the world can give you. You say, well, self-help is good. I need to do that. But here's the problem. Nothing good lives in me. So I can't help myself if I've got nothing helpful inside me. I'm going to say that again. If there's nothing helpful in me, then I can't help myself. And by the way, I can't help myself is the excuse everybody gives. Well, of course you can't help yourself because what you need doesn't naturally live in you. Sin has driven it out. You need something more than you. You need a new answer. You need a new way. No, I just need a new politician. That ain't going to help. I need a new government. That is not going to keep you out. Okay, the government can outlaw Krispy Kreme. And you will go get a Snickers. You see what I'm saying? The truth is that these other things, more money is not going to do it. More laws aren't going to do it. More politicians aren't going to do it. More, 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 more self-help is it's not going to do it. You got to have another way. But there is another cycle. There is, a, there is also the cycle of hope. The cycle of hope starts in a very, very different place. Here we start with, I desire good. But let's answer your question. Why do you desire good? Well, because it's good for me. See? I desire good. Why? Because I want to look good. Because I want to feel good. Because I want to be richer. Because I want to be better. Because I want to have a better job. Because I want a raise. Because I want a promotion. Because I... You see what's going on? This one doesn't start there. This one starts with, I seek God. Why? Because God's the answer. The Holy Spirit is the answer. The blood of Jesus washing you clean and the Holy Spirit living inside of you, that's the answer to your problem. Watch, I want to show you something. You start here. Watch, go back to the Krispy Kreme example. You start here, you wake up in the morning, you say, I want broccoli. I desire broccoli. No, you don't. You are lying to yourself. Because you know you want to Krispy Kreme, but you're going to start out your day saying you want to broccoli and convincing yourself in the mirror you want to broccoli until about six o'clock in the afternoon and your heart overrides your head and goes and gets what you really wanted in the first place. So you know what actually happened? You woke up and you said, I want broccoli, but you didn't mean that. What you meant was, I want Krispy Kreme, but I don't need Krispy Kreme, so I'm going to make myself want broccoli. So what did you wake up thinking about? Krispy Kreme. What if you woke up thinking about the Savior instead of the sin? Amen. What if you woke up thinking about God instead of the goodies? What if you woke up and focused on the one that could set you free instead of the one that's holding you back? 
What if we changed your focus altogether? You see what I'm saying? You got to let go. See, what we want to do, there was a book that came out a few years ago. It, it, was, it, it was on church growth. And, and the book, the authors were well-meaning. But, but the book basically said, find the weakest thing in your church and put all your focus on that. Because if you can make the weakest thing better, your whole church will be better. This, folks, listen to me, this is a lousy idea. Don't go focus on what you're not good at. Go focus on what God empowered you to do naturally. Do that. And the more you get better at what God birthed you to be good at, the better your lower things will come up. Because as you raise your ability in what God made you for, you'll raise your ability even in areas where you have weakness. you got to focus on God to do that, not on your sin. You focus on your Savior, not on your sin. You know what happens when we do that? When I seek God, watch, I find I find strength and I find strength. Listen, I I want you to hear this the way I'm going to say it. I find strength I did not know was there. You know why? Because I find strength that was not there until Christ was there. Because in me, there is no good, not in my sinful nature. Unless the blood of Jesus has washed me clean and the Holy Spirit has taken residence in me. You know what the difference is? The difference is not that once you get saved, God takes all that sin out and throws it away. That sinful nature is still in there trying to change your mind. Paul did not get saved at the end of chapter 7. He already believed in Jesus. This struggle is happening while he's a believer. It is not that sin is taken away away when you get saved it is that when you get saved the holy spirit moves in and the one that has already defeated sin now will empower you to come against it every time it raises its ugly head up in your mind that's what you got to find you focus on the holy spirit you focus on god you seek god and when you seek god you find strength when you find strength watch i'm gonna show you something you desire more You desire more, but more of what? Look, 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 look. You desire more of God. You know why? Because when you started to seek God, you found strength. You like that strength. You like the way that works. So now you want more of it. So you go back and seek some more of God. You find some more. Watch. This cycle is driving me down into a pit of despair. This cycle is lifting me up to where God intended me to be all my life anyway. (laughs) Do you see that? Y'all, I'm going to run out of breath. Y'all got to amen me or I'm going to explode. All right? Watch, watch, watch. This is self-help. This is spirit help. This is the spirit helping me to overcome. This is the spirit helping me to be more. This is the spirit helping me to be different. Why? Because there's nothing in me that can do this. There's nothing in me that can overcome this. There's nothing in me that can defeat this unless the Holy Spirit is inside me. And when he's inside me, he's already won the war. You see that? That's what we got to do. We got to focus on God. I don't need to wait. Y'all, y'all, listen to me. Do you understand how profound this is? Because almost all of you have been waking up every morning focusing on your sin, hoping you can get over it yourself. Okay, look at your neighbor. I'm not going to have you do it harshly, but look at your neighbor and say something. Look at your neighbor and say you're messed up. Look at your neighbor and say, and you can't fix it. Look at your neighbor and say, but I got good news. Look at your neighbor and say, the Holy Spirit can. Yes. Do you see that? The Holy Spirit can do what you can't do. Say, how does that even play out in somebody's life? Well, let me tell you a story. The whole time I was growing up, and I won't go into it. uh, I don't need to go into the details of it. But the whole time I was growing up, I was surrounded by people that were caught in that cycle. And so I was surrounded by people that were in a constant losing cycle, a cycle of failure. So I just assumed, since everybody I grew up around was living in this cycle, I just assumed I would live my life in that cycle. So what that did in my head was it told me, Michael, you're just a screw up. You've never been anything but a screw up and you're never going to be anything but a screw up. You're just a screw up. Deal with it, accept it and move on. But you see, there was a problem. I was convinced that God had called me to ministry. So I said, Lord, I, you, you really don't want me because I'm a screw up. You know, and God said, God said, no, I, I, I need a screw up. You'll do. 
By the way, have you ever thought about this? If you're messed up, the last thing in the world you need is for somebody that's perfect to come deal with you. Because when the perfect person shows up, all that does is show how messed up you are. And so you don't walk away encouraged at all. You walk away defeated because they're perfect and you're not. God needs some messed up people to reach some messed up people. See what I'm saying? He said, well, no, I got to get perfect before. No, if you get perfect, you're going to mess up the whole system. <laughs> so I was, I was convinced I was a screw up, but God called me to ministry and I knew God's church wasn't a screw up. So I, I, I went into ministry. I was struck in my late teens and early 20s by a couple of verses in scripture that really captured me. One was at the end of the Sermon on the Mount when people reacted to Jesus' preaching. What they said was he taught like one who had authority and not like their teachers of the law. I thought, wow, that's impressive. The other one was the disciples. And as the disciples spoke in, in Acts, the, 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 the people took note of them. And they, they took note that they were uneducated men. But then they remembered these men had been with Jesus. Because what they said is they taught with authority, not like the teachers of the law. And it real, I realized that if you're going to teach the word God, you should probably teach it with authority. But I couldn't figure out how that worked until a professor looked at us one day in a class and said, men, because we were all men in the room at the time, not that way anymore, but it was at the time. He said, gentlemen, he said, the, 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 the word of God is always true. The word of God is always right. The word of God is always powerful. Don't you dare. Preach the word of God weak and apologetically. I went, oh, I can do that. You know why? Because it's not my words. My words you can let go of as soon as you walk out the door. But God's word you better hang on to. You say, well, why? Why is God's word better? Because it's God's for starters. But furthermore, it's been around for thousands of years and none of us have been. So I can preach God's word with authority. And because I've learned to preach God's word with authority, most of you think I'm arrogant, completely self-confident, and never question anything I think of because I'm not going to question God's word. I'm going to preach it with authority because it's always, 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 always right. You see that? My words I second guess all day. Then I realized something else. See if I can get you amen in this. God intends to change the world. Amen. He intends to do that through his church. God, whoa, whoa, see if you, see, oh, no, think through this. God intends for his kingdom and his church to grow. Amen. Now, wait, wait, wait. God's will always happens. Amen. <laughs> you see what I just told you? I grew up on the screw up train. But God allowed me to get a ticket on his train. And his train don't screw up. And there's no way it's going to mess up. So I became convinced that God was going to grow the church. And if the church didn't grow, all that meant was I had to get me out of the way. So I started getting me out of the way. And God started bringing people into his church because it's all about him, not about me. And I began to realize, you know what? If God wants this to happen, it's going to happen. The only question is whether I get to take the ride or not. Folks, are you listening to me? You may not be a preacher, but I need you to hear me. God's going to change the world around us. He's going to do it. He intends to do it. It's his will. And the only question is whether we're going to take the ride or not. Changing the world is all about God changing you. And God changing you happens right here. So I got a question for you. You're probably not called to ministry. And Krispy Kreme is probably not your problem. Well, a few of you it is. <laughs> but God just spoke to you. There's something in your life that you've been waking up and it's on your mind first thing in the morning. It's been kicking your butt every day of your life. And you're in this cycle. And it's driving you into a pit of despair. And if you stay in that pit of despair, listen to me. This cycle is what drives us to darkness. This cycle is what drives us to a place where eventually we wake up one day and we, we decide the world will be better off without us. That's what this cycle will do to you. You can't let that happen. 
My question is, can you wake up tomorrow and look at your Savior instead of your sin? Can you finally take that thing that's been kicking your butt and set it at the foot of the cross, set it at the foot of the cross, and then look up into the face of the Savior? And can you spend your day doing that? Can you become so filled with the light of the Spirit of God that there's no room for the darkness of sin? Can you allow your life to be so saturated with who God is, with who Jesus is, that it begins to slowly push aside all the failures in your life? Not because you're cool and not because you're smart and not because you're strong or not because you're all that, but because God is more than enough to see you through. Can you do that? Will you do that? Pray with me. Holy Spirit, in this room right now, I have talked about Krispy Kremes, but we all know we're not talking about Krispy Kremes. Holy Spirit, virtually every human in this room brings something in here today that they're in a cycle of failure on. Point it out right now. Show it to us. Now, Holy Spirit, give us the courage to set it down at your feet and let it go. Give us the capacity to to tomorrow morning wake up and set that thing out of our mind and put our minds on you. Whatever that takes. Worship music, reading the word, reading a devotional book, calling a Christian brother or sister, whatever that takes, let us do that tomorrow morning so we start our day with our minds on you. Then let us continually dig toward you the whole day through and let us do that in our lives day after day after day until there's no room left inside of us for the sin and the failure and we end up in a cycle of hope that is based and centered around your spirit and your presence. Heavenly Father, do this in our lives. Set us free. And then let us tell the world how they too can be set free. Father, show us. And help us do it. Pastor, come pray for us. Father, we've heard the word. Help us to again be hearers of the word. But not just hearers. Help us to be doers of the word. Lord, it's not self-help that we really need. It's spirit help. So, Lord, in those moments, just a moment ago, when we identified, when we said what that thing was, help us to leave it this morning at the foot of the cross. Taking your grace, taking your love, and being men and women of God. Lord, you do not ask us to do something that's impossible. You never have, you never will. You ask us to do what you will help us to do. Every person you healed, every person that you touched, you said, go and sin no more. Go with a changed life. Go with a new purpose. And you would not ask them to do that if that was impossible. So, Lord, give us spirit grace. Give us guidance the will and the determination, but the help that comes from God. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.